Welcome, everyone, to the fifth event in the series of five launch events of the new Central Baltic Program 2014-2020. We are happy to see all of you here today. And additional to the audience that we have here in Tallinn now, we are today also having an audience online through the online streaming of this event. We were happy to see the great interest towards our launch, pro, uh, launch events and uh, found a way of addressing the great interest in the form of online streaming of this final event today. My name is Linda Talve and I work as the communication manager of the Central Baltic Programs Joint Secretariat. Today, we will start with the presentation of the program by our Head of Managing Authority, Merike Nietebold. Uh, in the end of her presentation, there will be time for questions, which we hope that you will share with everyone so that you, we can all hear the questions instead of when we finish the session, all of you running to us asking the same questions individually. We can share the questions and the answers hopefully in the room and of course then also individual questions during the day to all of us are welcome. We're also welcoming questions to Twitter from our online audience. So you can find the Central Baltic program in Twitter with the information on the screen and we will hopefully get questions and then be able to address them in the end of Merike's presentation. After Merike's presentation at 10.15 we will break for 15 minutes and then also the streaming will be uh, paused and we will move to the thematic parallel sessions in the rooms here on the second floor. We have four parallel sessions according to the priorities of the new program. You have in your registration registered yourself for one of these sessions and your name tags serve as a little hint on which session you have registered for. So the light blue ones are for priority one with project manager Ulari Alamets on business development. The green ones are theme and priority two, environment, with project manager Samu Numminen. Dark, grayish blue ones are priority three, with project manager Ivo Volt. And priority four, education, with project manager Pille Laaksonen, have an orange name tag. This is for you to know which session you have registered for and all the re sessions will take place on the second floor in the rooms that are marked in the agenda. Also in the parallel sessions, Twitter questions and all questions also from the audience here are very welcome. So please make use of us during today. After the parallel sessions, the streaming will end and uh, we will continue here to lunch and after lunch we will have the afternoon for networking and partner search and some of you have booked consultations with your project ideas with the project managers and these will take place then in the afternoon in the rooms that you see in the agenda according to the priorities. You have gotten materials when you came and these are now on our new website as well for you to use after the event and also for the online audience you can uh, have the materials available. And uh, there is a leaflet called Partner Search Requests which comprises of all the partner search and project ideas that we got in the registration for all of our five launch events. So here you can see 
partner search requests from all the program area countries and hopefully find something interesting for yourself. And also there is the brochure presenting our new program, the themes, priorities and all the specific objectives that we will cover today during this event and we hope that this brochure will serve as a good support to the presentations and also for your future use. And the materials, as said, are available on the website already. And as this event is being streamed, we hope that the schedules keep so that we are set in the rooms after the, after the plenary session. We are on time in the rooms for the thematic sessions to start on time so that uh, the streaming schedule also holds. And the recorded sessions will be available for one month after this event, which also allows everyone to split themselves between the four sessions and you will later be able to see also the three that you will today miss. <laughs> so this is good news for everyone. Yes, this was the practicalities and then we can kick off the day, Mary can eat the world and we're ready to launch the program. So, good morning everyone from also me and really nice to see all of you here today. And really nice to be here for our last launching event. I think we are now really, really ready to launch the program. As you heard from Linda, we've had um, already four events and this is our fifth and final launch event. All in all, we had almost 600 people registering for these events. So there has been a big, big interest towards our program and this of course makes us really happy. And then we have the, the great modern possibility of, of showing this event also online for anyone who is interested and who couldn't be in one of our events. And maybe to say that this is an opportunity that we're really looking into more and more in the future. So in a big program area, we're trying to organize events in the future so that there will be online possibilities for also our different types of services in the future. A few words about how we got to this point, how the program got into being. There have been a lot of people participating in the process and it's been quite a long way. We started almost two years ago and, um, and now, now we are here to launch the program. And I know that many people who have participated in, in the process are also actually here today, so it's nice to be sharing with all of you. So we've had almost 100 people participating in different working group meetings or the so-called joint programming committee. From the regions, from the national level, our different stakeholders coming together to discuss what we should do in a cross-border context. What are the challenges that we want to solve together? And then also deciding on which elements should go into the program. At the very beginning of the programming process, when we had selected our four themes, we um, had so-called thematic seminars, where stakeholders, almost 300 of them, participated and um, told us what you think are the most important topics for cross-border cooperation and, and what should be included in the program and what kind of, of ideas you have, what, what should be taken into account. And then when the program was almost complete. We had a series of public hearings. So we had either people participating in live events or sending us com comments online. So more than 200 people or organizations gave feedback at this um, final stage also of the program. And now we are here. We have a program that has been sent to the commission for approval. And um, we've received comments from the Commission and we know that the programme will be approved either late this year or at the very beginning of, of next year. And the programme draft that has been sent to the Commission you can find on our website and then of course as the programme will be approved then we'll put the, 
the final versions also online. When we are starting the new program, we are in the wonderful position that we've had one period of, let's say, testing out the Central Baltic behind us. So the Central Baltic program started in 2007 in that period, and now we have spent several years cooperating, funding projects, and we know that we are building on a lot of experience. First of all, there's a lot of experience um, of co cooperating, you have partnerships, you know each other quite well, there are networks that exist and we can start building projects on these networks. The regions participating in the programme are very much the same as in the previous period. The only difference really is that from Finland we have Satakunta and Pirkanmaa regions also participating now in the, in the new programme. We had in total 122 projects in the last programme. A lot of good things were done and this work was taken also in, into account when we were preparing the new programme so we could, could um, in a sense, use those projects as a basis and now choose themes or, or foci that build on, on the work that has already been done. And certainly we also learned about what it is to manage an EU-funded programme and I will share some, some findings and, and some things that we have learned later on in my presentation. So at this stage, I would actually start with one of my most important messages, and uh, that is that we are here for you. And we are a lot of people who I would like to call up to the stage now. So we have colleagues from all around the programme period participating in the organising of this event, but also then will be there for you in the future. Yes, so I'm happy to introduce to you, first of all, first of all, people from our Turku office, our secretariat, who will be working with projects. So our project team consists of firstly Urari, working with Priority 1, Samu, working with Priority 2, environmental projects mainly, and then Ivo for transport and Pille for Priority 3, Vocational Education and Social Inclusion. And then we have Tina, who, as I say, works with all projects. So um, this is our project team. Then we have an info team consisting of Linda, who you already saw, and then Gersti. And in addition to these people who work in Turku, in, in one office, we also have a new system of national contact points. And I would be very happy to start with introducing to you the Estonian contact person, but there we have to, you have to use your imagination a little bit because we are having recruitment interviews tomorrow. So very soon there will be someone working in an Estonian contact point, but for the moment I can introduce to you Josefina, who works in Finland for the Finnish regions. Then we have Liga, working in Latvia, and Esther, working on Åland Islands. And we also have, um, in Sweden, we actually have two contact points. So it's one um, person split into two between the northern and Swedish, uh, northern and southern parts of Sweden. Annika Klaasson, who will be here later on today, and then Hans Björbeck. But um, yes, these faces, these people, these names, I hope that you remember and, and make use of because we're really here for you, happy to, to help you in, in any way possible. And I will tell you quite a lot about the services that we provide during this presentation of mine. Thank you. A few words still about the 
the national contact point. So this is a new concept for our program. And what, what it means is that in your country, you will have one person who is directly responsible for supporting your regions and your country. And this is, in a sense, a really kind of national egoistic person who's whose um, main role is to make sure that you in, in this country have all the information you need and you benefit the most from our program. They are there for you in case you want to approach the program, you want to have a consultation, you don't really know who to get in touch with, you can always start with your national contact point. Also, if you need someone to come and tell about the program to one of your events, please invite this person, they are already traveling around a lot and they, they will be able to help you with things like that. And then also they are, for instance, helping in partner search. If you need a partner from another country, I think these are the best people to, to start helping you. And then also they will be telling us about what they hear from the field and from you and will be telling us how we should best serve, serve the different participants and the different countries. So, we are starting a new program and there have been quite a few developments compared to the previous program, so I will spend a few moments going through what the new program is like and what, what you should know about it. First of all, I think it's important to realize that it's quite a focused program compared to the previous cross-border cooperation programs. And this is a development that I think is very much supported by people working in different programs, but it is also an initiative of the European Commission. Many times I think people have the impression that cross-border cooperation programs are about drinking coffee and meeting people and not really doing anything real. You know, what's the money spent for? The Commission reacted on this and said that programs need to really focus we need to show that we create a change in the region, that we actually have an impact. And I think we also really support this. It's, it's more motivating for us also to work, and I think it's more motivating for anyone also working with projects to be able to say that after our project or after some years have gone, after our project has, or program has ended, we will see that there is an actual impact for the region. And because we have a limited amount of money in the program and we have to achieve our results in a limited amount of time, then it's really crucial that we focus on certain themes, certain topics, so we don't spread out our activities too much. And this is the work that has been done in the past two years, trying to identify which are the, the concrete themes where cross-border cooperation makes most sense and where with these these funds and with this time we can actually do something concrete and tangible and show results. And results, result orientation is one of the big keywords for the new period. We need to show results by the end of the program. So we focused on four priorities and within those we focused in total on 11 specific objectives. And for each of these specific objectives, we thought, we've thought about what is the, the result that we want to achieve at the end of the day. And to show this result, we have identified so-called result indicators and output <coughs> indicators. And those you can find in our program document, in our program manual, in the brochure that you have for this event. And these indicators are really crucial for us in the program to see whether we are on the right path. When we see how the, the target values start growing, we see whether we are actually likely to meet the targets that we set. And therefore, these indicators are really, really important also for anyone who thinks about applying for a project. Because we will need to show by the end of the program that we've met our targets. That's of course what we want to do. So we want projects that help us achieve those targets. So when you think about your project idea, please go to these indicators and please think quite honestly, quite realistically about whether you will actually contribute to these. 
these indicators will be an absolute key when we decide on which projects we will give money to and which not. So use, use those in your thinking and in your preparation. And also I think when you will be talking to my colleagues and you will discuss, be discussing your project idea with them, I think they will more or less always also direct you to these indicators and help you in this assessment of whether your project actually fits this part of the program or not. One of the things that we have taken on board as a way to really emphasize this result orientation is a so-called two-step application process. So it means that if you are a regular project, then you will, in the first step, send in a more general description of what it is that you want to do, what results you expect, how your project fits into the general picture of the program. And then if, according to the Secretariat assessment and the selection of the steering committee, your project idea does support the program, then you will be given a green light to proceed with the planning and, and only for the really relevant, strategically important projects, we will make you go through the trouble of, of filling in all the detailed information about budget and, and um, activities and outputs and timetables. <coughs> So this really is the idea that if, if an idea is, is strong, then the technicalities we can deal with, and, and that we, that's a smaller problem than if we would have a lot of technically um, well-done applications, but they don't have any strategic relevance. And also it's a way for, for reducing the risk for you, so only the people who, who have quite a good guarantee of, of getting project funding will have to do all this hard work with filling in the complete application. I mentioned that we are building on the basis of the already, already um, implemented projects, I'm just showing quickly the, the different themes that we have chosen for the program. So we are adding some new elements, focusing compared to the no, um, old program, so there's a bit of a mix of, of old and new themes in the programme. And also an important thing is that we've got two so-called horizontal objectives. So ICT and low carbon economy are things that can be dealt with and, and should be dealt with in many projects across the different themes. So ICT can be used as a tool or as a working method in any, any of the themes, for instance, and, and low-carbon economy in the same way. A few basic facts about the programme. First of all, we have, in the new period, 115 million euros for projects. And this is quite a lot more than we had in the previous period, when we had 96 million. The co-financing rates are the same as in the previous period. So if you're a partner from Estonia or Latvia, then you can get up to 85% co-financing and you have to put in at least 15% of um, the partner budget yourself. And Finnish and Swedish partners get up to 75% and then they put in at least 25% uh, of their own money. A minimum requirement as it is a cross-border cooperation programme, is that you have at least two partners from two member states. And that in the activities and in the description of what it is that you want to achieve, you show a clear cross-border added value. So you really explain to us why this pro project should be done in cross-border cooperation, why it's not enough to just do it nationally or, or in some other kind of setting. And then I mentioned that we have a two-step approach for regular projects. This um, regular projects is important because we also now in the new program have a, um, something called small projects, and this is new. So with small projects, we mean projects that have a budget of up to 200,000 euros ERDF and a duration of maximum two years. Anything above Above that is already then a regular project. And these small projects you can basically, basically have in, in all specific objectives. So if you think that this is the 
best way to implement your project, then that's, that's what you can do. About small projects, just also that they are then matched with the lighter application and, and later on a simpler reporting. I mentioned in the beginning that we've learned a lot about how to manage an EU-funded program. And um, we've worked a lot with simplifying the program. If any one of you was in our last showcase conference for the old period in Stockholm, you might remember that I was sitting in a panel discussing, discussing the new program preparations and someone asked um, or raised the question of um, how difficult it is to implement a project and, and somehow we talked about the, um, the difficulties of, of managing a project and I said that we are working with simplifications and I promise that by the end of the process you will see a bullet point list of things that we have simplified. And this is now the bullet point list. And it covers three slides, which I think is quite a good, good um, result, but of course the, it's up to you to, to um, judge. So what we have done for the new period is that first of all we will have an online application for applying for a project and then later on for implementing the funded project. And this is actually something that a lot of people asked for, for instance, in the public hearing. So I'm hoping that this will make a lot of people happy. We have gone through our processes. And one thing, for instance, is the annexes related to applying for a project, which is the most um, immediate thing that you will notice now. And we've really critically gone through every single annex. We've really questioned ourselves and our old habits and asked, why do we need this annex? What does it give us? Is it really required? And if we haven't found a convincing answer, then we've skipped the annex. And this is, of course, a process that will go on during also the implementation of the program and the different steps of program life. We're really going to think about what we ask from you, and we will only ask for the things that are really crucial and, and really needed. We have widened the possibilities for organizations to be partners. So technically, in the future, as long as you're not a private person or a large, large company, then you can be technically a partner. Also, both private and public money is eligible as co-financing. This is technically much, much easier than in the previous program. I will tell you more about, let's say, the other side of this coin, which is that partners in the future will have to be more and more relevant. But this is, this is another theme then. Also, we've jumped on board with a Europe-wide initiative called Harmonized Implementation Tools, which means that programs across Europe are looking at what are the key elements of, let's say, an application form? What are the things that all programs need to know? What, and, and the same for project reports and, and many other things. And um, there is a set of harmonized tools. For instance, we will be using a set of harmonized application forms and harmonized reporting and harmonized eligibility rules for costs, meaning that if you apply for funding from another program, then if they are using the same harmonized tools, then you will face the same application form questions and the same reporting questions and the same rules for eligibility. And this would, of course, make your life easier. Again, here I have to put a little disclaimer and say that we don't know how many prog programs are going to use the to these tools and not everyone is going to. So in the worst case, you might apply for funding from four different programs and still have completely different rules. But if you're lucky, then, then um, you will ma find another matching harmonized program. I mentioned that we will have the small projects and really then a lighter application and lighter reporting in the end. So the point of a small project is not to spend 190,000 of the 200,000 on managing the project, but you really should be able to spend most of the, really, really most of the money on actually implementing and getting the results. 
And then for the two-step call, we think this is a simplification for you as really only the projects with a very good um, likelihood of getting funded will be asked to do all the nitty-gritty details of the application form with all the dates and, and budgets and um, outputs and deliverables and, and what have you, and annexes and, and all of that. Another, I think, really, really good thing for you is that we have introduced the concept of preparation costs. So a project that is finally approved, whether it is a small project or a regular project, once it is finally approved and sends us their first progress report, you will get a lump sum of 10,000 euros, which will cover costs from your preparation period. Because we know that preparing a complete application, it does take time, it maybe requires traveling, maybe you need to do a small study. So we've thought that, that 10,000 euros will be there to, to cover part of those costs. During the program implementation, there will be a number of simplifications, very many related to the budget and, and the financial management of the, program, uh, the project, because that's, that's really where we see that the partners struggle maybe the most. So we will be using a flat rate for office and rent costs, meaning that you will get 15% of your staff costs covered without a single invoice calculation method um, supporting document. That money is just automatically counted in our system and, and it's what you will get covered. We will have a possibility for project applicants to use a so-called lump sum system, which means that, let's say that in your project you plan to do a series of trainings and these trainings will be very complicated. You will have many external experts and you will have a bus tour taking around the, um, the participants and you will have coffee and lunch in different places during the days and you will publish different materials and you will have um, room rent and a lot of things going on. So it might be easier for you, instead of sending us all the invoices for all of these events and all the uh, maybe price comparisons and, and different supporting materials, it might be easier for you in the application phase to tell us, we are planning a series of 10 trainings, and, and then you show us a calculation method for how you, how you estimate the cost of these events. And you show us that, let's say, the organizing of these events will cost 80,000 euros. And you tell us that you will put an indicator for showing that these events realized and you will have you will show us that in the end you have organized 10 events with 50 participants each this is the indicator and then when you implement the project and you organize your events then once you can show us that the 10 events took place and there were 50 participants in all of them then you get your 80000 euros if you really spent 77,000 on the trainings or you spent 82,000, we don't care. You get your 80,000. The downside here again is that, well, of course, in the application phase, you have to show us the detailed calculations for how you arrived at this 80,000. And also it's a system of all or nothing. So if in one of these events you only had 49 participants, then you get nothing. So it's really a question about setting um, good indicators and, and setting the price right. But again, for, for events or for activities where you would have a lot of invoices, then this might be a really, really useful tool. Further on, we will be using a system of flexibility in the budgeting budget. So for most of our budget lines, you will be able during the implementation to overspend that budget line with up to 20%. This of course does not mean exceeding the total project budget. So you still have to find money from another budget line. And of course the activity that you are doing must be in line with the project and it must be relevant. 
but this means that you can you have some flexibility in the budget without filling in papers with it, without us approving those changes. And then when it comes to paying out money to the project, we have a number of things that will be improving. First of all, the commission has come to your assistance and given us in the program a deadline for paying out money to you. So when a project report arrives on our table, first of all, actually, there will be an advance payment of 60% of the money that you have reported in that report. So that money comes to you without any checks from our side. Then we will start checking the report and within 90 days we need to have finalized our work and paid to you the remaining up to 40% of, of that um, claim. And this, this I think is a really, really good thing for you. First of all, money will be moving faster you, and also you will know what you can count with. You know that within 90 days if there are no questions and the clock doesn't stop, then you will get your money. Also, we have internally changed our procedures. We used to have a managing authority and a certifying authority with different tasks in the payment procedure. Now these have been merged so that in the future there's only a managing authority. And this allows for, for us to um, simplify our procedures and, and to make, make our work smoother making it easier for us to meet the 90-day deadline. Another thing that has been much requested by our partners in the previous period is reducing the number of reporting periods. And this is something we will be doing. We used to have three reporting periods per year. Now there will only be two. So less paperwork for you. And finally, some maybe more things about what we have done and how we have changed our procedures. First of all, when you read the program manual, you will for more or less all the different kind of procedures and different steps of the program implementation, you will find deadlines for our work. We didn't really have those in the past, but now we are telling you how fast you can expect us to work and, and you can help hold us accountable if if we don't hold up to the agreement. You saw a row of um, contact or let's say project team people. One of these people will always then be assigned as a contact person for an implemented project or approved project. And um, this one person is more or less the only person you need to know from the program. This is the person you will turn to in any type of questions. So you don't have to think about who in the program deals with this or that, but you can always just turn to one, one person. This is also a bit simplifying the system that we have so far had. And then when you read our program manual and you get to know our rules, you will notice that we have tried to, or we have identified some of the things that really caused problems or misunderstandings in the past. And we have addressed those by, for instance, raising the limit for when you need to ask for tenders and bid at three. And also we've defined a closure period for the program, making it clear what costs, when should be paid by whom by the end of the program. So that, because that was another thing that really, really, really caused a lot of problems for the project. So we've tried to really give clear guidance on, on these critical issues. So these are the things that we've thought about so far. And as I said, this is an ongoing process. And, and as we start with, with other processes and, and as we learn also during the new program, then I'm hoping to be able to, to add points to the list. But this is what we can promise at this stage. And this is what you can expect from the new program. So if you are thinking about planning a project, and applying for a project in the Central Baltic program. What should you consider? I've put together a few slides with some pointers, things that we really, really want you to think about. But before going into those, I would say that the first thing that we would like you to think about and to realize is that time is going really, really fast. So if you are thinking about 
applying. And if you are thinking about applying in especially the first call, but even in the second, then start planning immediately. Once we have a lunch break or once the day is over, call your partners, set a meeting, start really discussing the practicalities of the project, agree on who does what by what time, so that you are ready when the call opens. And I will tell you about the times of the calls a little bit later on. So the first thing, and this is really coming back to what I said earlier about the, the focus of the program and the specific objectives and the, the results, is that we, of course, will fund projects that contribute to our program objectives. So read the material carefully. Um, don't fool yourselves. Be honest when you, when you look at the indicators and when you think about your project idea and, and see whether they really match. And we're, we're very keen to, to be implementing the program together with you and together with, with all the concrete and practical ideas out there. And, and we really need your ideas. We have the money, you have the ideas. So this is a cooperation between all of us. Getting, getting about the, the good change in the region. In this period, a big focus is on practical results. If you look at the result indicators, then you will notice that they really they reflect change. So a result indicator might be that there are more exports or that there are more ports with improved services. So this means that, let's say, let's take the ports with improved services. We will really measure by the end of the program how many ports have improved services. So it's not enough for partners to get together to think about what services might be nice and to put together a plan and to publish this plan and it looks really nice and bright colors on the cover and that's it. No, we need you to maybe do the plan but then also implement it and put it into action and do those improvements. So simply networking, getting together, talking about things, planning things, that's not going to be enough because we really want to see action this time. We want to see results. And I think this is also a really positive thing because I think it's more motivating for, for everyone to work with a program that actually gets something done um, rather than the, the critique that we sometimes face about just getting together and are we really doing something? Yes, we are really doing something now. And um, here's a small picture about kind of illustrating the, the, the cooperation character and, and the um, the nature of the new program. And it's also very much a picture of how the program periods have developed. So it all have start, has started with networking, getting to know people, building networks, building trust. And of course, this is extremely important because this is the basis for all, all the future activities. But this is, in a sense, this is what Interreg programs did a couple of programming periods ago. Then we have moved to a stage where you, within these networks, you start, you know each other, you've talked, and you get an idea from someone who's like, ah, oh, that's how you did, okay, that's, that's interesting. And then you might go back and, and maybe at some point in your own organization, you actually implement this idea. So you're learning from each other. But you're still all doing your separate things in your separate municipalities or your separate countries. But now we're really trying to be at the um, far right-hand side of the arrow, doing things together. So in the program document, really, we've tried to identify the themes where cooperation makes most sense and where you can identify common problems with partners across the borders. And then you together think about the solutions and you solve these things together. That's, that's where we want to be. I mentioned that the technical eligibility of a partner and a partner's funding has been relaxed, but we are then putting much more focus on the relevance of the partners. So we will be looking in the project applications at whether the partners are the right ones and the best ones to implement this project. Do they have the competence? Do they have the mandate to do this? 
are they, are they the ones that we can trust to bring about these concrete results? So for instance, if, if a project is about developing small ports, then we need people who really work within that field rather than, I don't know, an educational institution in one country and, and an NGO dealing with, I don't know, human development somewhere and they, they come together and make a nice plan again. So that's not the point, but we really need organizations who can and will do practical things. Very much linked to this is the sustainability of results and end users. So meaning that, of course, we, we want to fund projects that make sense and that do right things, and therefore these right things will also be continued after the project has ended. So not so that you get a money, pot of money for a certain period and then when, when the project has ended it's all over, but we want to see things live on, things be taken into use to see really this impact. And there it's really important in our mind that the end users of the project results will be involved so that they feel that the results that the project is doing are really relevant for them and they are useful and therefore they will be taken into use. And this is something you should consider already when you make the initial plans for the project. You think about how you will build this sustainability into the project. And with the end users, of course they can sometimes be partners, but they can also be maybe your steering group members, so they can be guiding you and directing the project in the right direction, or they can be just invited to working group sessions or, or working meetings where they can give their input to the project. This is, this is up to you to decide what's the best way to do it. So, maybe now you have some basic facts about the program and you have some <laughs> inspiration for what to think about when planning the project. So we are moving towards the first call and as I said it will be coming sooner than we all expect. It will be launched on the six, uh, 18th of December. So on the 18th of December our e-monitoring system will be opened so that you can, you can go in and type, type in your project application and send it to us. And you need to have sent your application by the 9th of February which is when the call closes and the database closes down. And if you have submitted to us a small project application, then you will get information on the steering committee selection in April, and projects can start as of the 1st of May. And if you have submitted a regular project, then in April, you will find out whether your um, first step application, so the the more or less the idea, the, the concept of the pro project was considered relevant for the program and whether you should continue the detailed preparations of the second step application and then the final decisions will be made in August so that the regular projects can plan a start as of the 1st of September. A few words about the general concept for our calls. We are planning between one and two calls per year, slightly depending on how, how the dates go, as long as funding is available. And we have defined that for each priority and specific objective, basically, there will be at least two calls. So even if we would get 1,000 brilliant project ideas in the first call, we will not be giving out or allocating all money in the first call, but there will always be at least two calls. So this is an assurance to, to all of those for whom the 9th of February comes too quickly, although we anticipate that there will be a lot of people and a lot of good ideas already in the first call, and we're really eager to, to start assessing those. So keep them coming. And the... Um, Selection of projects is such that the secretariat, so the people you saw here, will be assessing the projects and then a steering committee consisting of representatives from both the regional and national levels of, of all our participating countries will then be selecting which projects will get funding. 
And as said, there will be a second call, and the second call will start in the autumn next year. So between the 24th of August and 23rd of October, you can go in and fill in your application. And then you will get the decisions so that as of February 2016, the small projects can start, and the regular projects as of July 2016 can also be, you don't have to start on the 1st of July, you can fit it according to your summer holidays. And then we have made plans already now for the third call. It's so far away that we're not um, announcing individual or concrete dates yet, but in the spring 2016, the third call has been planned. And that means that small projects can then start in the summer of 2016 and regular projects at the very end of 2016. So, for those of you thinking about applying in the first call especially, but also later on, we have material for you online already. So the program manual we have published just over a week ago, and this is a document that really everyone who thinks about applying should read once, twice, as many times as needed. And then for any additional questions or any additional clarifications to the manual, then you can get in touch with our colleagues. But the manual is there and it will give you basic information about all the um, rules and all the processes of the program, telling you what you should take into account when planning the project and when later on implementing it. I mentioned that the e-monitoring system will be opened and closed on the dates for the calls. So this means that even if you would be really far in your planning today, you cannot now go in and start filling in the application. You can only do that on the 18th of December. But what you can do now is you can go to our website and there you will find a PDF file with the application form questions. And you can download that and you can copy it to Word and you can start discussing and, and already typing with your partners the answers to the different questions. And when then on the 18th the e-monitoring system will be opened, then you can go in and you can copy paste and you can more or less send us the application on the 19th of December maybe. When you look at the file, you will find the different sections of the program application and then you will find concrete questions. And for each of the questions you will find a letter symbolizing whether you have a small, medium, a large text field at your disposal. And then at the beginning of the document you will also see how many characters small, medium or large is so you know how much you can write. We will be organizing some more events already this year actually. These are events called project development seminars and they will be organized for those partners, those lead applicants who feel 98 to 99% sure that they will be submitting an application in the first call. So these will be working sessions where we will go through the application form, we will go through what, how the e-monitoring system works and we will go through how to fill in an application and what to think about. So really working sessions and the dates and the places you see either here or you will find on our website. The registration is not quite yet open but will be soon. And then in addition to these events we are all the time consulting project ideas. So our project team members are consulting today. They have been consulting in, in various consultation days. They are also ad hoc consulting, so if you want to come and visit us or you need us to visit you, this is possible. You can send us emails, phone us. The important thing is that you meet us before you send in your application. I think this is really one of the key messages that we are there for you. We're really, really keen to give you advice, give you hints, um, discuss your partnership, discuss your idea, discuss your, um, <clears throat> your 
your contribution to the results indicator, for instance. So we're there for you and we really want all projects to have met with us at least once before you submit the project idea. So please don't, don't sit alone and, and type on the project application, but, but do get in touch with us and, and we're really there for you. And none of us bites. So, submitting the application happens really then so that, that each project will have a lead applicant who is responsible for filling in the application in the database. The e-monitoring system will be opened and closed as, as described earlier. We will, latest in December, maybe even earlier actually, um, put online the different templates that you might need for the annexes for the for the application and then also we will publish a guide for filling in the application form, going through the different questions of the application form, telling you what kind of information you should, should include. The e-monitoring system, as mentioned, is not yet available for you, but it will be for the time when the call is open. And then if your project idea is successful and gets funded, then this is the tool through which you will be doing all the reporting later on. You will be able to upload documents. This is also the way to communicate with us. So it's, it's kind of an all-encompassing system. It's, it's a complete system. So my main message for today, use us. We are here for you in, in very many different ways. We are here physically, but, but as I said, we are also online and, and reachable by phone. And, and, um, and also you can arrange live meetings with us later on. The project development seminars I mentioned, individual consultations I mentioned, contact points in each country also have been mentioned. You remember who they are, and for Estonia, we'll soon find out who they are. All of us um, are on our new website, which was published yesterday, late evening or afternoon. So the website for the new program is now up and running with materials that you will need, with our contact details, with all the events and all the news you know that we're on Facebook and Twitter. And then if you're interested in the programme, then I really, really suggest that you join our mailing list because that's, that's the way to get all the news immediately when, when they become available. So news on calls and, and events and registering and what have you will be shared through the mailing list. So that's an, the easiest way for you to, to be be on, on the same page with us. Yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Maybe I should take the opportunity before, before I get thrown, thrown back with your questions and thank my colleagues and thank especially Gersti who has been organizing these events in a very professional and, and good manner, I think you hopefully you will be satisfied with with the services and and the the online streaming has hopefully worked well and this is all due to Gersti and then really my great <laughs> and great colleagues we've been traveling around for three weeks and and I think we're all really happy that this is the final launch event and the program is now open but I'm happy to take any questions from Twitter or live and, and answer those. Hello, my name is Matli Kopti from Estonian Maritime Academy. Uh, I have one um, practical question. As I read this um, program manual, and there is an issue about first level controls. Uh, for Estonia, what means uh, enterprises? Mm -hmm. uh, am I right that um, the first level controls in Estonia 
uh, will be done by some company and not anymore? No. No? No. Um, I don't know. Why. I don't know. I have <laughs> here on the paper. Sorry. Okay. And due to this, this question was uh, okay. raised. No. Only in Finland, oh, the systems, the FLC systems will continue as they have been more or less from the past. So only in Finland will there be um, auditors who you have to pay for, but all in, in all the other countries it's still a centralized system and and okay. especially in Estonia it's it's not going to cost you anything. So. Okay, I will have to see what what it says. Okay. Yes, I will I will okay. check. Thank you. Merike, have you read the manual? <laughs> no, I've only written it. I <laughs> That same question came actually through Twitter, so it was good that it was already now answered. Anything else? Yes. <coughs> yeah, if, if we think about the bigger projects, and you said that they can start in September, but can we, with our own risk, start the project already in the spring or something that we are saying that we are starting now if we have money to do it already. You can, but it's whatever you do will not be counted as part of the project. You can tell us in the application that this is what you do and this will of course show us that you're very committed to the project and it, this, there's a clear need clearly because you're starting already, but you can't include the costs in the project later on. So the, the costs will be eligible from the start date until the end date. Okay, thank you. Anything more? We're very happy to answer your questions also after, but here, one more. The Stockholm Keskkonna Institute of Tallinna Keskus. Millised on hindamiskriteerimid ja kes viib hindamist läbi steering committee Volitusel. So the question was about assessment criteria, what they are and who, who assesses projects. So in the program manual you will find the assessment criteria. We will have so-called strategic assessment criteria and we will have implementation assessment criteria. And also you will find the scoring system and the explanation for how you get each score. So those have been set in the manual. And then also it's been described that once we get the applications, we will have two people from the Secretariat assessing each project. And then the actual selection of the projects will be done by the steering committee. And the steering committee members are not yet known. We will, on our website, then inform you of who they are. But they will be from either from the regional or national level or social partners from all of the participating countries. Still, someone brave. One more brave. I will take. Hello, my name is Mikael Orkomes from Exedia. Um, just a question related to the uh, submission and, and let's say competition between uh, ideas. So, so if on on round one, let's say, mm -hmm. there's a lot of applicants, and and you still believe that you have a good idea, wasn't uh, accepted. Can you resubmit the same idea again? Yes, yes you can. And all the projects that we have to, for one reason or the other, reject, will always get an explanation of why they were rejected. So we will always refer to an assessment criteria and then give a comment for why this project wasn't found good enough. And then, of course, you can and should take this information into account. And, and then you're, of course, very welcome to try again and and submit as long as we have calls, unless you're, of course, successful in, in between. Hello, I am Katri Jalon and Hidaviru Enterprise Centre. Can you please tell some words more about this small project? Mm -hmm. What are they? <laughs> they, are, they are small projects for more, in a sense, people-to-people -people activities for concrete, small, local, but still cross-border relevant activities. The idea behind has been that we don't want our projects only to be for 
really, really big organizations with a huge financial liquidity, but we also want to make it possible for smaller organizations and, and smaller communities maybe to participate and then really have this lighter management of the project. We will be doing one specific objective about these, um, this community improvement, specific objective 4.1, only through small projects. So that's, that's where we see that this people-to-people -people is, is most relevant. But in addition, you can have small projects in, in more or less all the priorities if you think it's, it's the best way to implement your project. And then really the budget, budget limit of 200,000 euros ERDF and duration of two years. More? Anything in Twitter more? Gersti? No? Twitter is silent for that. If no more questions, yes, one more. Hello, Mari Kaiser from Estonian Fund for Nature. Can you explain a little bit more specific the in advance payment system? As mm -hmm. I understood, we first uh, report to first level control. Yes. And then it takes still about four months to, re to report to reach the joint sec secretariat. Yes, so the advance payment is, let's say, not advance in the meaning that you would get money before doing things. But it's advance in the meaning that you get it earlier than before. So it means that you first implement your project, you do your half a year activities, then you send a report exactly to the first level control. They have three months to check it, and then you put together the project report and send it to us, and then you get your 60%, and then we do some checks, and then you get the remaining 40. Everything is relative. <laughs> Advance in EU terms means Less late. <laughs> from University of Tartu, about the involvement of Russian partners. Uh, if we want to invite them to some of our, our events, how the costs can be covered? You can probably do various things. The partners, the actual partners of the project, have to come from the program area, but Russian partners can be they can be so-called associated partners. So taking part in the project activities with their own costs. Um, but you can also have them, in some cases, maybe as experts, so that you, you have ways to cover their costs. But yeah, I think maybe the, the most common or easiest is for them to be associated partners, having an interest in the project and participating at their own cost. But again, this is something where, where you have the concrete idea and you come to talk to us, then we will be able to give kind of more specific comments or feedback on the way that you have chosen. Okay, if these were the last questions for now, we are here at your use all day long. And also the parallel sessions will hopefully be able to address more detailed questions about the priorities and the specific objectives under each priority. We will now end this session. Thank you for all questions and interest. And we will find the rooms on the second floor and continue there at half past. And the streaming will then continue. And for the online audience, we can say that the streaming, you click on the left-hand side menu and select the priority session that you are most interested in. Thank you.